Welcome to Andrew Womack Recorded Live, a weekly podcast featuring Andrew's latest live teaching sessions, along with his other classic teachings through the years. And now, here's Andrew. I've been talking about how to be a success. God created us to be a success, but I've spent so much time trying to redefine what success is. And basically, to me, Romans 12, 1 and 2 summarizes what success is. And it's just knowing God, it's being a living sacrifice. And then you renew your mind so that you follow what he tells you to do. And if if you love God with all of your heart and follow his instructions, whether it's big or small, then you're a success. And I tell you, that is important. And I'm not undoing any of the things I've done, but all of that being said, I believe that God is leading us to do more than what most of us are reaching for. So I am from here on going to try and encourage you to start believing bigger. But that doesn't undo what I'm saying. It's God doesn't call everybody to be on television. God doesn't call everybody to do what I'm doing or to do what somebody else is doing. Look at this passage of scripture here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 12, it says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. This is so obvious and yet it is amazing how easy it is to fall into comparing yourself. You know, I have to deal with this because I've got goals of reaching as far and as deep with the gospel as I possibly can. And I'm just constantly thinking of, we were talking today about a $43,000 per month commitment. Am I ready to pull the trigger on it and do it or not? And I told him, I've been so busy at the Bible college. I can't make a decision now. You're going to have to give me more time and let me pray about it. I'm not going to make a decision without seeking the Lord about this. And I'm constantly trying to reach further. And when I meet other people, I think, man, you know, could I do the things that they're doing? And you fall into these habits. I'm not sitting here bragging on people, but it's not wise. You can't judge by what I've done. You can't judge by these things. You know, one of the reasons I started my own minister's conference was because I'd go to minister's conferences and they would sit you according to the order of your importance. And if you were really important, if you had a big church or a big ministry, you got to sit with the big dogs. But they'd always sit me at the back and I'd leave condemned and discouraged because why aren't I doing what everybody else is doing? It's a natural tendency to compare yourself with other people. But I just decided to start my own Bible, uh, my own minister's conference, and we don't wear three-piece suits. We don't compare who's the most important. We don't sit you according to your importance. And you could be sitting right next to a guy that pastors 50 people, and he could be sitting next to a guy that pastors 5,000. And you know what? It's, there's danger in comparing yourselves among yourselves. And I think that a lot of times people do this and are constantly saying, you know, can I do what they've done? I'm not saying that you totally ignore that. You can be inspired by other people. You can take inspiration and you can say, man, if they did it, I can do it. And so I think that there's some benefit, but at the same time, you, this just reinforces what I've been trying to teach, that it really just goes back to your personal relationship with God. If you love God with all of your heart, and if you in true honesty can say, I'm doing everything that God is leading me to do, maybe you haven't accomplished it, but you're working on it, you're heading in that direction, then you're a success and you can't measure yourself and compare yourself with other people. I think that this is super, super important. And so what I want to begin to talk about uh, this morning, I'll continue this tonight, is about how important your imagination is. And this may, there may be a disconnect when I use that because a lot of people think that imagination, they, they define imagination in the context of fantasy. They say, well, you're just imagining stuff and they just mean that you're fantasizing. But imagination is powerful. And there is a right use of imagination and a wrong use of imagination. And I've got an entire series on this that goes into more detail than what I'm able to do here. But first of all, let me just give you a quick uh, 
testimony, and then I'll get into some scriptures on this. But on January the 31st of 2002, Charlie and Jill were with us in uh, Buena Vista at Trail West Lodge. We were holding a minister's conference, and it was a culmination of about two or three months. God had been speaking to me. There was things that triggered. I'm not going to go into that, but man, it's a great testimony. You ought to get my teaching on taking the limits off God. It would go into this in more detail. But the Lord had been dealing with me, and on January the 31st, I finally came to the realization based on Psalm 78, 41. That verse says that in their heart they turned back uh, to Egypt and they limited the Holy One of Israel. And God spoke to me that I was limiting him by my small thinking. And what small thinking, what that meant to me was, I knew that God wanted me to have a worldwide ministry. I, I have known that since God called me. I don't know how I knew it. I just knew it. It was in my heart. This is what my desire was. And I've always believed that somehow I was going to reach people all over the world. But it wasn't time in the beginning and when I started trying to speak that to people, I mean, we were pastoring, the first little church was in Seagoville, Texas, and the largest crowd we ever had was 12. And normally we'd have two or three. And we were struggling and starving. And when you tell people, man, God's called me, I'm going to reach the world, and they, nobody can see any evidence of it in your life, you just get so much criticism and so much kickback and pushback from that that after a while I quit speaking it because it was damaging to my faith. Everybody criticized me all the time. And I still knew that it was going to happen, but uh, I just realized it was off in the future, so I was dealing with where I was. I was taking things one step at a time, and we were seeing growth and increase and stuff. But over the years, I had got comfortable being at a small level. And anyway, I'm not going to, I'm trying to get through this quickly, but I hope that you understand the points. I'm trying to give you enough information to let you understand where I was. We had been growing. And I mean, in uh, 2002, when the Lord spoke to me, the Lord had spoken to me in 1998 and told me it was time to go on television. I knew that eventually I'd be on television, but I didn't know when. I knew it was expensive. I knew it could ruin the entire ministry if I did it incorrectly, it could kill us and we'd never recover. So I'd always just pushed it like kicking the can down the road. I hadn't dealt with it. But in 98, the Lord finally told me it was time. I began the process. We started on television January the 3rd of 2000. And uh, from 98 to 2000, we grew tremendously. From 2000 to 2002, when the Lord spoke to me, my ministry had doubled. We were reaching 6% of the U.S. market at the time that the Lord spoke to me. And so it's not like we weren't doing things and we weren't reaching people. And there was growth. But what God had put in my heart was just huge compared to where we were. And at the rate we were growing, I actually sat down and figured this out. At the rate we were growing at that time in 2002, it would have taken me over a hundred and something years to accomplish the goals that God put in my heart. And, uh, you know, unless the Lord does something unique with me, I just didn't have that much time left. And so a number of things happened and I came to realize, God, something's got to happen. And I was thinking, I'm thinking too small. And... Anyway, a lot of things happened, but finally I just came to grips that even though I knew that God wanted me to be at a certain place, I couldn't see myself there. I had become content ministering on a smaller level. I had gotten to where I'd done it so much and it was easy. And since we started on television, when I was on radio only and traveling and ministering, we struggled financially constantly. I had bill collectors after me uh, my board actually told me one time, you're bankrupt, shut the doors, we're going to shut you down. And I lived on the edge of disaster constantly. But when we started on television, I mean, it's just like everything exploded. The Lord had told me in 1999, June the 26th, 1999, that I was just beginning my ministry. After 31 years in the ministry, he told me, you're just now starting to do what I told you to do. And when I started on television, everything changed. And since that time, we've never been behind financially. God has blessed us. We, things were working. It was kind of exciting. And you know what? There was a temptation to just enjoy the lack of pressure 
and relative success for a period of time, but the Lord showed me that it, I was limiting him. I was complacent where I was. And I was also, this is the biggest fear for me. I was fearful that if we really did start seeing lots of things happen and if I accomplished what God wanted me to do, I was fearful that it would hurt my relationship with God. And I had gotten to where my relationship with God was so good that even though I'd been through a lot of bad times, man, I just enjoyed knowing that God loved me. And I had seen so many people that once they started growing and lots of people coming, it goes straight to their head and it ruins their relationship with God. And I was fearful that that would happen with me. That was my biggest problem. But anyway, on January the 31st, 2002, the Lord spoke to me that I had limited him. And it was primarily, I knew where God wanted me to be but I couldn't see myself there. I had been so busy just functioning where I was and doing what God had given me to do at that time. I pastored three churches. I'd been on radio since 1976 and I'd done all of these things and we'd put out at that time probably 10 million free cassette tapes and things like this and we had done a lot of stuff and I was just so busy doing what I had to do that I hadn't sat down and allowed myself to see me doing what God called me to do. I believed it would happen, but I hadn't spent time meditating on it. Anyway, I hope that helps understand where I was. So that's where I was. And when God spoke this to me, I made a decision. And I, I said, I think Charlie might remember this at that minister's conference, but I got, that was on a Thursday night, I believe. And on Friday morning, I got up and I told him, I said, I don't know how long it takes to change this image on the inside. But I said, I am going to see myself ministering to billions of people. I am going to do what God called me to do. And I said, I'm going to start focusing on this, meditating on it, and seeing myself do what God called me to do. And it involved my imagination. And so... Uh, long story, but I began to just start this process and I didn't know how long it was going to take. It took me a whole lifetime to get to where I saw myself at a certain level and how to see yourself functioning at a different level. I didn't know what it would take, but I just decided I'm going to start the process, whatever it was. And the testimony is that within two weeks, my whole life changed. It was quicker than I realized, much quicker than I realized. And I mean, things begin to explode. At that time, we covered 6% of the U.S. market. Today, we cover 3.2 billion people on the planet. Our ministry has grown. Our income back then was less than a million dollars a month. Now we get, um, or well, excuse me, it was about a million dollars a year is what I meant to say. A million dollars a year, and now we get over $40 million a year just in the U.S. alone, not including all of the other offices and things like that. We have just grown exponentially, and it transformed. And one of the things I think that will verify that this is really God, and it's not some technique or some physical thing I did to make this happen, was when the Lord spoke to me January the 31st of 2002, it was right after the September the 11th attacks, and most of you probably don't have this perspective, but uh, media ministries like mine suffered tremendously after the 9-11 uh, attacks because people were glued to their television, watching all of the things happening, wondering about what was going to happen, and they weren't watching the television ministries. And income just tanked a number of ministries. I could name names right now, people that you know who are very famous and they nearly went out of business because the Christian, you know, out of sight, out of mind, people quit supporting these ministries and they tanked. Mine was just the opposite. Things begin to increase for us after that. It was, it was counter the trend. And, and this was less than six months after those 9-11 attacks. And it took me about two to three months to process what God was speaking to me, to write a letter and to put it out to my partners. And so nobody even heard about this outside of my staff for two or three months. And yet within a week or two weeks of God speaking to me and me beginning this process, our income began to double. And there was nothing physical that had happened. I hadn't done anything, but there was something spiritual 
that had been holding back the supply of God. And just like Psalm 78, 41 says, I limited him in my heart. Man, I can preach on this. Matter of fact, I have preached on this. I got an entire series on this. But let me just say, some people think, well, whatever God wants will happen. Que sera, sera. And if you have that attitude, you are never going to accomplish what God wants you to do. Because even though God has a plan for every one of you and he created you for a purpose, you have to cooperate with him in order to see this purpose come to pass. And you can limit what God wants to do in your life. The very fact that it says they limited the Holy One shows you that God doesn't just automatically do what he wants to. You can limit God by unbelief, by fear, by all kinds of things. And so uh, anyway, when I started cooperating and begin to start imagining, that's what I'm going to try and focus on here and tell you how important this is. It transformed me on the inside. And immediately things began to happen in the natural realm that there was no physical explanation for. It was a spiritual dynamic. And there are some of you, I, I haven't got time to explain this fully, but there are some of you that you should prosper and see more success than you do. You've got the talents, you've got the abilities, you've had opportunities, but it just seems like that there's something that just limits you. It never works out. It, things are going bad. And, and I'm all for blaming the, the devil for everything that we possibly can. I got no love for the devil. But with most people, you can't even blame the devil. It's you. It's your small thinking that is limiting what God can do with you. I know that doesn't sound like that's encouraging, but it really is if you can receive it and recognize that the limitation isn't out there somewhere. It's not fate or something that's holding you back. It's you that's holding you back. It's the way you think. Your life is going the direction of your dominant thought. Another way of saying this is it's like if you were uh, digging a tunnel underground. You can't just walk through dirt and rock. You got to go hollow a spot out and remove that dirt before you can go in that direction. You can't go anywhere in your physical body that you haven't already been in your mind. If you can't see it on the inside, you will not see it on the outside. Let me use some examples that, you know, there's people that want to be healed and you pray for healing and you're begging God for healing. You want it desperately, but you've never seen yourself healed. You don't see yourself well. You see yourself sick. And yet people are wanting to experience something that they haven't already seen. And I know that this terminology I'm using may not ring everybody's bell. You may express it differently, but what I am saying is absolutely true for every one of us. You cannot experience anything that you haven't already conceived in your heart, in your way of thinking. That is a powerful, powerful truth. Look at this passage over in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. This is a familiar passage of scripture to a lot of people. Isaiah 26, 3, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Did you know that the word mind right here, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the word, but it's, this is the, I think this is the only place or maybe one of two places in the Old Testament that this word was translated mind. Everywhere else, it's translated imagination. And the word literally means conception. And again, I've got a long teaching on this. I'm just going to say this quickly, but you go study it out and I believe you'll find this to be true. That your imagination is your spiritual womb. It's where you conceive things. If you can't see it in your imagination, you can't give birth to it. That's a major statement right there. 
Let me define your imagination. Your imagination is just your ability to see things with your mind that you can't see with your eyes. Like right now, if I asked you, what does your house look like? Every one of you could describe your house to me, and yet you aren't looking at your house. You've got a mental picture of your house. If I asked you what your dog is like, or cat is like, or car is like, or whatever, you could describe it because you see it. You think in pictures. God made us this way. This is how he created us. You know, I've used these examples. I know some of you have heard these things, but it just is the best way I have of expressing it. But if I say, think of dog right now, you don't see D-O-G. You see a dog. You think in pictures. And my words affect your picture. If I say, all right, think of a dog. Some of you are thinking of a little tiny chihuahua. Some of you are thinking of a Rottweiler. Some of you, probably you think of an animal that you have. But you know, my words can change your image. I could say, now think of a big dog and immediately some of your image changes. I could say, think of a big black dog. Think of a big black mean dog. And I could just keep using words and I can focus your thoughts. It's your imagination. You may not use that, but it's your imagination. I can focus your imagination and make you see certain things. A good minister, this is what they do. They use word pictures. They, they speak in ways that help you to picture things. This is why Jesus used parables. He would use a parable about a man sowing seed because everybody had seen it. They understood that. But if you use words that don't form an image on the inside of a person, the person will lose it. You can't retain just words you retain words as they're associated with images and pictures. Man, I could stay on this forever. I know that this isn't weird. It's just stuff that most people don't think about. We don't sit down and analyze it. But if you analyze it and understand why you do what you do, it'll help you to do it better and it'll remove barriers for you. But you know what? You think this is how God made us to think. If I was to ask you right now, how do you get from here into Woodland Park? If you were to ask me, where's the Safeway or something in Woodland Park? Did you know I can describe it to you? And I can tell you, you go down here to the first light and you take a left and then I can sit there and count them. I say, not, not including that first light on Highway 24, you'd have to go past the light at 67, that's one. And then you have to go down to... Uh, this other street, let's say that's two. And I could count the lights and tell you which light it is you turn at to go to Safeway. And did you know what? I can't see Safeway from here. I can't see those things from here. But this is how your memory works. You can't remember anything that you can't picture. Amen. If you can't see it, you can't remember it. Man, if I wish I had more time, but 1 Chronicles chapter 29, I believe it's verse 18. David was praying, oh Lord, keep this forever in the imagination of their thoughts. And he was talking about help them to remember. He used that word. This is how you remember. Every one of you have a picture of the house you grew up in. Now, some of you probably traveled and didn't have just one place. And so you may not have a clear picture. But if you grew up in one house... You could, you could draw a picture of that house to me. You could draw the, uh, the plans of that house. You could tell me how many bedrooms you've got. Did you know you could go to your house right now and if I could say, how many doors do you have in your house? Most of you have probably never sat down and counted how many doors you've got, but you could tell me because all you got to do is look at it in your imagination and count them. I could ask you, how many windows do you have? I bet you nobody's counted all of your windows unless you had them replaced or something. And yet you could go and in your mind, you could count every window and you could tell me exactly how many windows you've got. You know, all that is, is your imagination. Some people think that using your imagination is fantasy or it's immature. You know, let's deal with reality. You use your imagination 100% of the time. You are thinking all of the time and your imagination is how you do that. And your imagination is just simply your ability to see something that isn't real or present. Amen. That's right. Amen. See, I, I can see Safeway down here. I can see how many lights, but I can't see it with my eyes. I'm seeing it in my imagination. And did you know I can also invent things? 
I have invented a few things. I have made some things that there wasn't anything that I could see, but I sat down and thought about it until I saw how to do it. And you can invent things. This is how people invent things is with an imagination. Without your imagination, that's the conception. This is how you do anything. And unless you understand how your imagination works and begin to start using it for you instead of against you, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 talks about a vain imagination. Your imagination is also one of the most destructive forces in your life if you are using it negatively. If you're negative and see yourself failing, if you see yourself with limits, if you see yourself that I, I'm not this type of person, I can't do this, your imagination will literally destroy your life. So your imagination is either a good thing or a bad thing. And sad to say, because most people don't understand this and they don't deal with it, their imagination nearly automatically works against them instead of for them. It's like a limiter, a governor that holds you back. And see, this is what my testimony was until I knew what God wanted me to do. But I... had never imagined myself doing it because there was multiple reasons. One thing I knew it was off in the future and I needed to deal with now and just, you know, take things step at a time. Plus there was fear associated with it, fear that it would cost me my relationship with God. And so I just kept ignoring it and I hadn't focused on it. But when the Lord finally spoke to me, I realized I am going to sit down and I will see myself doing what God tells me to do. I will accomplish it. And I sat down and started using my imagination to just picture all of the things that God was telling me to do, picture them coming to pass. Some people would look at that as a waste of time. It's just the opposite. This is how you conceive things. And you can focus on something with your imagination. You can begin to take the inspiration, the leading that God is giving you, and in your imagination, see yourself accomplishing this. And it will conceive something. You will become spiritually pregnant and it will force a birth. Here's another application of this that many, many years ago, I was studying John chapter 14, verse 12. And that verse, Jesus was speaking and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And as I read that, I just thought, God, I believe that, but I've never seen the same miracles that you did. I had seen some things happen, but specifically, I just started focusing on raising the dead. And I said, I've never seen the dead raised. And yet you gave me a command in John chap um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. That's not just to apostles. That's to any person who's a believer. And I said, Father, if this is what your word says, and I studied it, I said, I'm going to see the dead raised. 
And I said, and so what I did, I took every instance in the Bible where a person was raised from the dead. There's eight of them recorded in scripture. If you don't include the multitudes that rose at Jesus' resurrection and came out of their graves. But there were eight individual instances and I took them and I, I uh, wrote them down and I just began to meditate on these. Meditation is a huge part of your imagination. It's important to read scripture. You can't meditate on what you don't know. But where the real power is released is when you read it, God speaks things to you and then you close the Bible and you see what he has spoken to you coming to pass in your life. If you learn about that your spirit is righteous, that's one thing to have information. But you need to take that and meditate on it until you see your spirit man righteous, till you see yourself righteous. If you've been told that you're righteous and even if you can pare it back, repeat those facts, but if you haven't seen it, it won't release its power in your life. This is where the power of God is released is in seeing things. So I took these scriptures about raising from the dead. I meditated on them. And when Jesus calls Lazarus, called Lazarus forth from the dead and with a loud voice said, Lazarus, come forth. Man, I'd read those things. Then I'd close the Bible and I would sit there and see myself walking up to a grave. And I would meditate on it and I would see myself saying, Lazarus, come forth. I would see Lazarus coming forth. I would meditate and imagine what would this be like? And I spent hours and hours doing this and I started meditating on raising the dead. And I started, every time I read somebody raised from the dead, I saw myself do it. I didn't just read about Elijah and Elisha raising somebody from the dead. I started seeing me raise people from the dead. I saw myself, I sat there and with my mind, I imagined me laying on top of that boy and praying over him until his flesh grew warm. And then I saw me getting up and down and walking and praying and then go back and laying on top of him and him sneezing seven times and then sitting up. I saw myself doing, I've seen myself do all these things. That's imagination. And did you know what happened? Within a very short period of time, I start, I was so consumed. This is where my thought life was. I was so consumed with this that I started dreaming about raising people from the dead because I was so focused on it. I dream all of the time. I'll dream a hundred times a night. I dream all of the time. I dream in color. I can start and stop my dreams. I just dream, dream, dream all the time. And anyway, I got to where every night I was raising hundreds of people from the dead. It was so real that I'd wake up and wonder, did it really happen? And you know, within six months of me doing that, I saw physically a man raised from the dead. You know why it happened in the physical? Because I'd already conceived it in my imagination. I'd been meditating on it and it came to pass. And then I saw a second guy raised from the dead. And then I went about 10 or 12 years without seeing a person raised from the dead. And one day I was reading those same scriptures and I thought, you know what? The same thing that I did before, it'd work again. And so I took those scriptures and started meditating on raising people from the dead. In a short period of time, I started dreaming about raising people from the dead. And then praise God, my own son was raised from the dead after being dead for five hours in a morgue with a toe tag on. Raised from the dead. And today, praise God, he's just healthy and alive. And I got a granddaughter that was born a year later because of my imagination. Did you know every one of you... Every one of you have the exact same promises that I do. And if you're born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've got the exact same power and anointing that I have. Amen. And yet many of you have not seen the dead raised or the blind eyes open or the deaf ears open or whatever. And you believe it. When we give a testimony about it, you're excited. You may even say, oh God, I wish that had happened for me. But the difference is, have you ever seen yourself doing this? Or do you see yourself as, man, this is beyond me. I can't see a person's blind eyes open. I can't get a person out of a wheelchair. If you can't see it, you can't have it. 
even though you know the scriptures, even though you can quote them. It won't work until you see it. And whether you realize it or not, you have an image of yourself. If I was to ask you right now, what do you look like? If we were talking on the phone and we, you were going to come here and I say, well, what do you look like? How will I know you? You could describe your physical person to me. Tell me if you're a man or a woman, if you're tall or if you're short, what color your hair is, what color your eyes is. You've got an image. You know what you look like in the natural. But whether you meditate on this, whether you think about it a lot, you also have an image of who you are and what you can do. And some of you have a very confident image. Man, you believe you could just do anything. There's other people in here that you have a very limited image and you limit yourself and think, oh, I could never stand in front of people. I could, if I was to ask you right now to come up here and give a testimony, there's some of you that have something that God has done. Maybe you've seen a great miracle. You have something that could bless people, but you can't see yourself standing in front of people. You are intimidated. You see yourself. You're afraid of what you would say or do. And that image will keep you from doing it. I don't care what you've got to share. Maybe you can talk one-on-one and you're just fine. But you, you have images that limit you. You have boundaries that you impose on yourself. And if you don't sit there and with your imagination overcome these limits that you've imposed on yourself or maybe somebody else imposed it on you. Maybe you were told your whole life that you're a zero, you'll never amount to anything. And that formed an image of the way you see yourself. It will limit what God can do with you. You cannot go beyond the way you see yourself. That is huge. You know, there was this guy, Don Crow, who is, he's been an associate with me. He was best man at my wedding. And Don's dad was a mean man. I met his dad in Ralston, Oklahoma. I, I've been to their home. And his dad was mean and angry. And they had, uh, I don't know, probably 50 or 100 junk cars on their farm that his dad would cannibalize and take parts from to repair and to do things. And he always got Don to help him work on these vehicles. And he was just a mean, angry man. And he used to tell Don all the time, he says, you're so stupid, you can't screw a nut on a bolt. He used, that was the normal line he said to Don. And you know, Don, this was 30 years after that. We were pastoring together. And Don and I would work on a car and I'd see him begin to shake when he would start putting a nut on a bolt. And I've seen him put a nut on a bolt and he was afraid that he had cross-threaded it. So he would undo it and put it back on and he would keep doing it until every time he cross-threaded that bolt. I've never seen Don put a nut on a bolt that he didn't cross-thread it. And it's not because he wasn't capable. It was because of a curse that was placed upon him. And for whatever reason, it affected Don and it was a limit. And I've never seen that man be able to screw a nut on a bolt without cross-threading it because of that's the image. And he, he had these words 
painted an image of who he was and it was a curse placed over him. Many of you, you wouldn't recognize it as a curse, but you've been cursed. You've been told you'll never amount to anything. You know, my mother, I just found this out not long before she died. She died in 2009, but she was a school teacher. And as a school teacher, she had access to our, you know, our test that we took, our IQ test and stuff like this. And my brother was, his IQ is something like 167 or something. Einstein was only 160. My brother, IQ wise, is smarter than Einstein. And he was just this genius. And I remember in grade school, we were talking about this and I said something about, so what's my IQ? And my mother said, oh, you were an 88. You're two points above an idiot. <laughs> and it was a joke, I think. <laughs> but you know what? I believed that my whole life until 2009. I said something and she said, that's not true. She says, I must have been joking with you. But that formed an image about me that I was only two points smarter than an idiot. Now I was a functional idiot because like I always made straight A's and stuff. I could have been on the honor society my whole time in school, but I intentionally made some B's because I didn't want to be associated with the, with the snobs that were honor society. So I intentionally would get a worse grade so that I wouldn't be in the honor society. So it never really bothered me that much, but I always thought I was two points above an idiot. And you know, there's things just like that, that your parents may say about you that affect your image of what you can do. And man, you could never do this. You could never do that. And I'm telling you with the Lord, you can change this image. You know, my brother was a mechanic. When he was 14 years old, he took a car apart down to the last bolt just to see if he could put it back together. We had a two car garage and it was for a year, just totally strewn with all of these car parts. And he took it apart. There was nothing wrong with it and just put it back together and rebuilt the thing, put a double bear carburetor on it. And the guy is just a genius. He can do all of these things. And he tried to make me that way. And you know, this sibling rivalry stuff, I didn't want to be exactly like my brother and have him tell me what to do. So I went the other way. I refused to ever learn anything about mechanics. And you know what? I mean, what I don't know about a car would amaze you. But after I got baptized in the Holy Ghost and I started renewing my mind, I started recognizing that I've limited myself. I could do this. And I remember that we had a washing machine that wouldn't work and I didn't have the money to get it fixed. And so I started praying and asking God to give me wisdom. And I started seeing myself being able to do that. And I started fixing my washing machine. And then I fixed this little thing that you lifted up. I've got it on my desk in here. I still keep it as a reminder because it was this little bread thing with... Uh, grapes uh, carved into it, a wooden thing. And when you pick it up, a music box played and it wouldn't work. And so I got that thing and I prayed over that and I made a project out of this. I can fix things. I, if I could take this to somebody else and they could fix it, well, then I could fix it. And I prayed over that and I took that thing apart and worked on it. And you know what? It's still on my desk. You pick it up, it still plays to this day, 30 something years later. And I use that as a reminder that I can do these things if I want to and if I can apply myself. And I had to start changing the image on the inside of me. And those are small things, but when it came to the ministry, I had to do the exact same thing. In order to go to the level that I knew God had spoken to me, I had never sat down and seen myself doing those things. You know, we built a building down in Colorado Springs and I was going to do it debt free, $3.2 million. And we had no money. It was, that building was a greater miracle than this building was. At that time, I, f I forget now what it was, but it was 20 or 30 years worth of income to come up with. You know, this building right here is about one year's worth of income for us. It was a much bigger step down there. But what I did, I had our contractor put duct tape down on the floor of every wall, every door, and he would make the tape so that, you know, you could tell where the door was. And I probably, I don't know, but I spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours walking around inside of that 110,000 square foot building, 
And I would always walk down the hallways. I'd always open the door when there was nothing there but tape on the floor. And I'd go in and I'd see all of these things. And I'd go in and I'd stand in a room and I'd look around and say, is this the way I want this room to look? There was nothing there. But in my imagination, I was looking and seeing. We had an auditorium and we hadn't built a stage yet, but I put two five gallon buckets down and put actually four or five gallon buckets and I put a four by eight sheet of plywood and I'd stand on it and in total darkness with nobody in the building, I'd preach and I preached a bunch of messages in that room. I'd preach and I'd see people's lives getting changed. And did you know in the natural, we had to stop construction. We had holes dug in the concrete and that people were mocking me. It's never going to work. You won't finish this. And yet I'd seen it on the inside. Once you see it on the inside, it's different. There are some of you that are trying to believe for something, but the reason it's a struggle is because you hadn't already got it on the inside. You have scriptures to quote. You have desires. You pray. You're wishing. You're open. But you haven't seen those things that you're praying for come to pass. And so it's easy for you to lose it. But once you see it, I hadn't got the words to describe this, but it's a done deal. And I, I walked those floors until I saw it. And I rejoiced. There was times that I would just be overwhelmed, praising God and thinking, God, this is awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. And we didn't have anything done yet. But it was done in my heart. And when we actually moved into that building, Everybody else now could see it. And so they were really excited and they were just screaming and yelling and people were praising God and had one woman come up to me and she says, you don't act excited. Aren't you excited? And I said, well, yeah, I'm excited. But I said, I was excited a year ago. I said, I've seen all of this. I said, I'm already dreaming about the next step. And I didn't get overly excited because I was excited a year before. There was times that I just fell on my knees praising God and thanking Him for doing it when there was nothing but tape on the floor. And then when it came to this building, of course, you know, I'm, I'm the one that said, I want the clear story. I want these big wooden beams. Now, I, our architects had to, you know, engineer it because they're, they're uh, 90,000 pounds per beam. And so they had to put their expertise to it and it changed a little bit. But this is basically the design I want. I saw it. And then every step of this thing, I came up here every day that I was here and I'd walk around and I'd look at it and I could tell people whether this is what I saw or not. And you know what? I saw all of these things. All of this stuff was inside of me at one time. I've seen it. I've seen this second building. I've seen bunches of, I've seen lots of things that I hadn't even told anybody about because what I'm telling them now is terrifying them. <laughs> and so I'm not telling people everything I've seen, but I see these things. And guess what? You are sitting in something that started as an imagination and it's debt free. And it happened because I learned how to start using my imagination to see things come to pass. And there are some of you praying for things, but you've never seen it. You need to get to where you spend time. You have to take the word. You have to have the right information. You have to be believing for the wrong thing. If you're imagining something that's not from God, God's not going to help you accomplish it. You've got to be inspired, but if you're inspired, then you've got to start seeing God's will for you coming to pass in order to see it come to pass. Some of you have heard me use this illustration. I'll quit because we've got to get out of here for the, so people can have healing school this afternoon. Last illustration, but there was a woman, a pastor's wife who had poor eyesight, these thick glasses, she had had people pray for her. She was disappointed. She didn't want anybody else to pray for her. And they had a... They had a um
healing evangelist coming to the church. And she knew that this healing evangelist was going to want to pray for her, so she tried to avoid him. And finally, the last day of the meeting, he just cornered her and he says, I want to pray for your eyes. So she said, okay. So he had her take her glasses off and then he prayed over her. And then he says, now can you see? And so she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes thinking, what's he talking about? And he said a second time, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And she thought, how am I going to tell if I can see if I don't open my eyes? So he said the third time, now, can you see? And she started to open her eyes. And he said, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. You've got to see yourself seeing before you will see. And she finally realized what we were talking about today. She saw, she had been, had poor eyesight for so long. That's how she saw herself. When she dreamed, she dreamed of herself with poor eyesight. It's the way she saw herself. And he made her keep her eyes closed and use her imagination. And she started praying in tongues until she saw herself seeing without glasses. And she says, I've got it. I can see myself seeing without glasses. And he says, now open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and she could see. That needs to happen more. There are some of you that are praying for healing and you want healing. You desire healing. You're desperate for healing, but you don't see yourself well. And so you're just going to pray and see if all of the pain leaves, if everything is instantly better, and if there are no problems, well, then you're going to rejoice. But you've never seen yourself healed, and that's the reason it's not coming to pass. You know what you'd be better off doing is instead of just trying to pray and believe right now and get your healing, some of you need to start working on just hoping that you're healed. You need to hope that you're healed. You may not be ready to believe that you're healed right now, but can you even hope that you're healed? Can you see yourself healed? Can you imagine what life would be like if pain wasn't dominant, if you didn't have these problems? Some of you have never thought that way. The only way you ever thought is sick. And this is what happens when you've been sick a long time. It gets in your mind and in your imagination, not just in your body. Getting your body healed is easy. But getting your imagination healed is something that takes effort on your part. So all I've done this morning is kind of, you know, give you an idea about what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to start, start tonight about how do you begin this process and how do you really do it. And I tell you, this could make a huge difference. It could help you become the success that God wants you to be. Amen. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719-635-1111.